Today, I'm uh, going to give my Christmas sermon. Um, my wife, Ellen, says I have a fluid sense of time. Uh, sometimes uh, I'm, I'm late, but I'm right on time for this one because guess what? We don't keep Christmas. It's been, I have to count it up, 53 years for me, I think, since I kept Christmas. And that last one was the one when I told my father, Christmas is wrong. And I'm not going to keep it anymore. At which point the house shoes that were purchased by my wife were thrown at me. And we had to go from there. My my father was a, uh, a, a very gentle man and a, a very, as best he knew, God-fearing man. And I have no doubts that uh, when the time comes, when his day comes to be given the truth of God, that he will accept. And we will have uh, different types of celebration then. You know, I was talked, uh, talking to a young mother in the church here recently. And our children have a lot of pressures. They have a lot of pressures in the schools they attend, amongst their friends in the community. And it's okay to have friends in the community as long as uh, there is not pressure to disobey God. In fact, we should be friends of the world around us. We are the salt of God that is sprinkled, as uh, Jesus Christ uh, indicated. We, you know, you don't pile all the, the salt on one place on your food. You sprinkle it around and it diffuses into the areas where you don't sprinkle it so that it, it has an effect and that's the way we are. We should be here, there, other places. We're scattered all over central Kentucky now. But our influence should go much further and wider than where we are. So our kids have an example. But sometimes, even in the church, we have not focused quite as much on teaching our kids as we should. We simply say too often, well, it's wrong. We don't keep it. And then the kids have to interpolate to figure out, well, what do you mean it's wrong? How's it wrong? Why is it wrong? What's wrong with it? In years past, and those of us who remember the, those decades ago, know that scriptures were given. Scriptures that illustrated to us why we should not keep Christmas. And then after a while, we started to say in sermons, well, we don't need to go over that one because everybody knows that one. Except that new generations were coming along who maybe had not heard those things and they did not know them quite as well as they should. And yet we were saying, well, we don't need to go over that one because everybody knows. Everybody knew, but everybody couldn't necessarily prove what it is that they knew. And we have to say that as our kids look out into the world around them, what'd you get for Christmas? It brings up a story in our family um, when my uh, stepdaughter, Laura, was very young. Uh, she was asked that 
question after Christmas on one occasion by an adult. And she was about, uh, you know, two years old, maybe a little older, asked that question by an adult. And she says, we don't celebrate Christmas. And mommy and daddy won't let Santa Claus come to our house. Sometimes that is the level of understanding that children have. And they look at it as fun because their sisters, uh, or not sisters, but their friends and schoolmates portray it for the fun that it is. It looks glamorous. You know, they start the Christmas carols in July now. And then they immediately uh, go to uh, Valentine's Day. Uh, and sometimes those songs, you hear people, and sometimes, if you've ever kept Christmas, you will catch yourself humming a song. They're catchy. Satan has power with music. And much of it can be wrong. But it's catchy. And it can be almost addictive. There's almost a universal joyousness it's called the spirit of Christmas. Spirit. Hmm. You sort of have to think about that a little bit. The spirit of Christmas. What is it that Satan is called? Ephesians, the second chapter. Ephesians, the second chapter and verse two. It says, in which you once walked, talking about the, 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 the sins that we used to practice, according to the course of this world, according what? There's a spirit here spoken of. To the prince of the power of the air. The spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. There, there is an individual, an individual who to a large degree controls much of the spirits, of the spirit of this world, has a great influence on what the world thinks, what the world looks at, what the world holds dear. Have you ever, have you noticed in recent years, this world is going nuts? Absolutely, to use a technical term, bonkers. I mean, some of the ideas that people are coming up with nowadays the Green Movement. Al Flatulence. I, I saw a program last week where it said that the flatulence produced by the cows of the feedlots of the United States produced more pollution to the ozone layer than all of the cars on Earth. And that is the level of intelligence that is driving our society. Worship the creation. Worship the creation. It also says in just over a couple of pages from Ephesians, the sixth, uh, the second chapter is Ephesians, the sixth chapter in verse 12. 
Ephesians uh, 6 and verse 12 talks about the battle that is going on. Now, there's a battle going on between God and Satan. Now, it's a mismatch because uh, if they both put on boxing gloves, uh, there is no fight. But God has a plan, a plan for salvation for the entirety of the world. And he says, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. So he, Satan has an influence on the world around us, and it affects us, it affects our kids, and it's important that we know what the truth is and that our children know it as well. First Peter, the third chapter in verse 15, tells us that you should know and that you should know that you know, and that you should be able to share that knowledge with other people. So that the world around, even though they may not follow what it is that, uh, that they should follow, at least there it is. First Peter Chapter 3 and verse 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Why? Why should you not celebrate Christmas? What should our children know that helps them realize that they should not celebrate Christmas? That's one of the things that um, impressed God about Abraham. God said, He'll teach his He'll teach his children. And he'll teach his family. He said that in Genesis, the 18th chapter. Genesis 18. And verse 19. And this is uh, right after uh, the one who would come to be uh, born as Jesus Christ came and before they went to Sodom and before they destroyed Sodom and that individual said for I have known him verse 19 in order that he may command his children and his household after him that they keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice, that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. A lot of promises made to Abraham. A lot of things that God said because of the relationship that he had with Abraham and because of the faithfulness of Abraham. Remember, Abraham took Isaac up on the, the mountain to kill him. After God said, he's the one that the promise is going to be through. I had to have Abraham scratching his head a little bit, said, wait a minute, he's the one, yet now you want me to sacrifice him on the, on the altar. If you follow through the story of when Abraham actually did that, they had the two workers that were with them. They loaded up the donkeys and they, they went up and they got to a place 
where uh, he was going to leave the workers and he and Isaac were going to go on up to the, the sacrifice site. And he told the workers, you guys wait here, we'll be back. Which shows that Abraham didn't know how it was going to work out, but he said, we will be back. And then he went up and it transpired and God said, no, 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 you really don't have to, to sacrifice him. I have a, uh, I, I have a ram here that will sacrifice instead. So Abraham passed the test, but he was a man who would teach his children. And so that impressed God. God wanted Israel to remember and teach their children as well. Now we'll get to some spe specifics about Christmas, I promise. But, but first, it's important that we know that about the truth, our kids need to know. Deuteronomy, the fourth chapter. Deuteronomy 4, verse 9. This is uh, uh, Moses speaking right at the end of his life uh, before he was taken up on the mountain and taken up by God. Verse 9, Only take heed to yourself and diligently keep yourself lest you forget the things your eyes have seen and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your lives. I want you to remember what it is that you have learned. I want you to remember the promises that were made to you and the promises you made to me. And it says, and teach them to your children and your grandchildren, especially concerning the day you stood before the Lord your God in Oreb, when the Lord said to me, gather the people to me, and I will let them hear my words that they may learn to fear me all the days they live on the earth and that they may teach their children, teach them also to fear God all of the days on the earth, or their days on the earth and their grandchildren all there. And it goes on down. And it should have come down to this very day. Israel was not faithful. But each of us has a journey to make out of the wilderness into the promised land that's promised to us. I want to ask a question. I want to ask it to the children. Speaking of some of these things that you're supposed to remember, it's okay if the adults listen too. Uh, is it okay to lie to your mom and dad? Hmm. It's a real simple question. Is, is it okay? Is it okay to lie to your mom and dad? Well, the answer is no, in case you were waffling with the answer there. No. God says not to bear false witness. That's one of the commandments, right? And false witness is a lie. You're called to court. You're called as a witness. You observe something and the court wants to know, is this person guilty or not? And let's say the person didn't do it. And you say, yeah, I saw it. He did it. Well, that's a false witness, isn't it? That's a, what is that? That's a lie. That's a lie. The ninth commandment, Deuteronomy 5, verse 20 says, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And that's one of those things that, uh, among other things, we're supposed to teach our kids, right? What Abraham was supposed to teach his kids, he might have learned the lesson a little quicker himself, 
because on a couple occasions, Abraham actually lied and was caught in it, but he came to have the faith that he needed for the relationship that he had with God. Now, here's the problem when it comes to Christmas. It's not the kids who are lying. In this world that we live in, moms and dads say, Johnny, Santa Claus is coming down the chimney. He's 300 pounds, and the chimney is uh, eight inches square. Oh, okay. Uh, Mom, how's that going to work? You don't have to think about it. It just happens. And if if uh, somebody else says, how's that work? Says, don't worry about it. It's a harmless lie. It's a harmless lie. And so we teach our kids out of one side of our mouth, oh, it's, you should never lie to me. Johnny, did you? Practice your piano? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I practice it. Hmm. Why is the piano book not moved? Why is it still uh, on the last page in the book and your lesson's on the first page in the book? Uh, well, uh, well uh, the wind must have blown it really hard. Here it is that we teach our children that it's okay to lie. And Christmas is a lie. Christmas is a lie. Christmas started as a lie. And everything about it is a lie. So why do people lie? about Christmas. Because they want to celebrate it. I had a, a conversation with a lady that I worked with and she wanted to know why I didn't celebrate Christmas. So I went through the process and told her, I thought I was making great strides and headway and her understanding because she was nodding in agreement and she was nodding in understanding and we get down to the end of it and she says well that's nice but i just don't care i just don't care i'm fine with lying to my daughter because it's a harmless lie lies aren't harmless lies have, have repercussions and lies have consequences well, who started Christmas and why lie about it? Let's talk about lying for just a second. Why is it that people lie? There's a man by the name of Paul Ekman. He's a psychologist and he formulated nine reasons why people lie. Did you... Uh, Johnny, did you go out and fill the, the well full of rocks? And now we can't dip a bucket in it? Oh, no, 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 I didn't do that. To avoid being punished was number one reason people lie. To obtain, number two, to obtain a reward not otherwise readily obtainable. That's number two. To protect another person from being punished, that's a little more noble. To protect oneself from the threat of physical harm. If you're John Jones, then I'm going to shoot you. No, I'm not John Jones. To win admiration from others. This get along with everybody routine. 
18, you know. Um, you're a champion swimmer. Well, yeah, I like swimming too. I like, I, I've, I've never been, but I'm sure I would like it if I, I, I like swimming. To get out of an awkward social situation, to avoid embarrassment, to maintain privacy without notifying others of that intention. I just don't have time to fool with you. So, um, uh, so no, uh, I don't need spectrum internet services. The most dangerous reason that Mr. Ekman came up with to exercise power over others by controlling the information the target has. As in the lie that Satan told Eve. You shall not surely die. About the lies that Hitler told the German people and the world. No, we're not killing Jews here. And this one can be mixed with half truth and half lies. And I will tell you, kids, in case you're in doubt, that a half truth is a whole lie. Where it says when you're in court, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And Jesus Christ talked about Satan in John, the 8th chapter, verse 44, said that, let's just read it. He's talking to the Pharisees, and he says, you're of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father, the devil, you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resource, for he is a liar and the father of it. Here he likens lying to murder. In Proverbs, the 12th chapter in verse 22, Solomon is inspired to write that, uh, that God hates lies. He hates it because lies hurt people. Lies about Christmas hurt people. Ultimately, there will be no Christmas in this world. Proverbs 6. In verse 16. Proverbs 6, 16. These six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. Seven things here. The second one of those things in verse 17, the lying tongue. And now let's look at verse 19. A false witness who speaks lies and one who sows discord among brethren. God has no place in his world for anything except the absolute truth. Now Satan hates God. Satan hates God's children. Satan hates you. And just like Satan used the lie to Eve to change the entire course of human history, Satan lies to us as well. To get the world to do what he wants them to do, this, this number nine reason that people lie, to exercise power over others by controlling the information the target has. Satan 
Satan knows that if he can get you to disobey God, he will be able to bring a curse on you. It's like the doctrine of Balaam. You've heard the story of Balaam. This king wanted this uh, prophet to go and, you know, I'm going to pay you. you. You know, it's like you're a paid assassin. I'm going to uh, pay you to go over here and curse these Israelite uh, bunch over here. I want you to curse them. I'll give you good money. And Balaam said, I, you know, I, I, I can't do it. I think there were four prophecies that came out of this exercise that uh, Balak, the king, wanted Balaam to curse. And each time, the prophecy got more and more beneficial for the children of Israel. And finally, Balak said, I thought paid you to go over there and curse them and, and you bless them every time and you bless them more and more and more every time and Balaam said finally he said I can't do but what God uh, tells me I can do and so he said I had to bless them so that's the curse you get is blessing them But Balaam finally leveled up and said, you paid me good money. I will tell you how you can bring a curse on Israel. The doctrine of Balaam just caused them to worship a foreign god, a, a, a false pagan god. Cause them to turn against God. And that'll make God angry. And that'll bring a curse and destruction on them. That's, uh, that's covered uh, in Jude, the 11th verse. I would say Jude, the first chapter in the 11th verse. Better not say Jude, the second chapter in the 11th verse, because there's only one chapter in Jude. So, And it's covered, let's go to 2 Peter 2. 2 Peter 2 and verse 15. It says, it's, they have forsaken the right way and gone astray following the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. He didn't lie, but he caused damage to the children of Israel. Talks again in Revelation 2, verse 14, about the church in Pergamos that was similar and was told to straighten up their act because they would also uh, suffer. How is Christmas wrong? It's idolatry. It's the worship of the wrong God. Satan knew if he could get mankind involved in worshiping another God, what other God was that? But he knew if he could that a curse would come on them. A curse would come on the world. A curse will come on this world for worshiping the God that they don't care to hear about. I don't care. I don't care. I want my little girl to get presents and to reject the one true God and to follow the spirit of Christmas.
But this world is separated from God. Why did God allow this? Because God has a plan. One of my favorite sayings is, the best minds that the world has had to offer have led us to the brink of destruction. We can't do it without God. We can't do it without His Spirit. We can't do it without rejecting the way of this world, including the Christmas that drives the entire economic system of this globe. In the end, God will bring everything right. But God is allowing this to go on. Well, how did Satan go about it? Cause people to go to idolatry. Remember, this is the Satan that lied to Eve, deceived Eve, caused Eve to sin. Did that change the course of the world? Betcha. What would this world be like if everybody was serving God? It would be a lot different. The Houthi rebels in Yemen wouldn't be shooting missiles at ships going into the, the Persian Gulf. Russia wouldn't be attacking the Ukraine. The Gazans wouldn't be murdering Israeli citizens and the Israeli army wouldn't be leveling Gaza. The world would be a lot different. I think it would be a lot better, don't you? Satan lied to Eve. And he did it by causing her to worship him. Because that's what it's all about. And that's what Christmas is all about, is the worship of Satan. Now, there are other names involved there. A fellow by the name of Nimrod, who started the entire system. And a woman by the name of Semiramis. And people say that's all legend. And it is legend, parts of it that we know are not specifically spelled out in Scripture. And you can't always go by legend to say absolutely, item for item, this is the way it worked. But the system is here, and the system system does that what was it that satan knew that made him realize that he could succeed in getting them to worship nimrod jeremiah the 10th chapter interesting scripture there it's not jeremiah 10 2 that we normally turn to when we talk about christmas because jeremiah 10 2 does say something well we'll just read jeremiah 10 2 while we're there well, let's go to jeremiah 10 1 hear the word which the lord speaks to you O house of israel guess what we are the house of israel the world around us doesn't doesn't um, I want to say agree with it. I think they probably agree with it in hiding. They don't want to agree with it. They don't want it to be true, but we are. And there's plenty of proof out there. I can't go through today, but there's plenty of proof out there that we are the house of Israel. And God said, you're a special people. You're to be living by a special set of rules you're to be close to me. I chose you to be an example to the world around you. And this is how you're supposed to act. Verse 2, thus says the Lord, do not learn the way of the Gentiles. Do not dis be dismayed at the signs of heaven. 
you know, the sun, moon, and stars. We'll get there in a minute. For the Gentiles, they're worried all about the sun, moon, and stars. They're dismayed at them. For the customs of the people are futile. And I'll stop there. That's where we normally start. Futility. Uselessness. Satan wants us to waste our time in futility and uselessness. But in verse 23... This explains how Satan knew he could succeed. He said, O Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man who walks to direct his own steps. Mankind simply can't get there on their own. They have to have a relationship and a connection with God in order to succeed. When you turn away from God deliberately to other gods, you're seeking after a God who can do nothing who can't help you, who can't harm you. Satan's whole goal is to keep mankind's mind off of the true God. Do you know why people celebrate Christmas? Because it gives them a warm, fuzzy feeling. The spirit of Christmas driven by the master of spirits. That's what the psychologists say. It's not about Jesus. It's never been about Jesus. Some people sort of force the idea of Christmas around a whole series of lies. Jesus was not born on December the 25th. Jesus was born in September. Around the fall holy day seasons. I always thought Jesus was probably born on the Feast of Trumpets. What does the Feast of Trumpets mean? The arrival of the Messiah. Well... Sort of makes sense to me. Is there a scripture? There's not. God doesn't want us to focus on when Jesus Christ was born. What time of the year? We're sure glad he was. We're sure glad that the Father sent him to be the Savior of the world. It doesn't matter when he was born. Jesus Christ could have been an eight-month baby for all we know. The Bible is absolutely, totally silent about it. What is important is that he was born. He lived a life of example to us. He suffered everything that we suffer. And he died for our sins. And then he was resurrected and given the authority to give us life. And to share his inheritance of eternity with those who would accept the sacrifice that he made. That's important. That's important to you and me and to all of mankind. Did you know that the spirit of Christmas 
can actually have physical changes in the human brain. People talk about, oh, I love Christmas. I love it. I just feel so good with Christmas. And it comes from the psychology of being in synchronization with something acceptable by a group you identify with. I'm part of an entire global system that centers and gravitates around this concept of Christmas. Oh, man, I am part of the group. You know what it does? It increases the level of all four of what they call the feel-good hormones. In the, in the human brain. Dopamine, serotonin, endorphins, and oxytocin. They're called the feel-good hormones. So you go run. Oh, man, you really worked on it. You really worked on it. And you finally finished your run. And you're out of breath and everything. But then those endorphins kick in. Oh, you feel good. I am really pleased at myself. I finished that run. Oh, man, I can feel it just rushing through my body, those endorphins, and it feels so good. Satisfaction, that warm, fuzzy feeling, that sense of togetherness. We love our families at Christmas time. Oh, those, that oxytocin, it makes me feel good. Satan knew he could foster something like that. You think about it, you know, um, we, we think about mm, uh, being possessed. We're told, well, you can't be sure if it's possession or insanity. Do you think Satan could blunt the effects of the moon's effect on the tides? Maybe. Can he change the effect of the production of serotonin in your brain? I, I can see where that might be a possibility. Can he make you feel good? Maybe. But you have that spirit, and Satan wants you to have that spirit, and Satan knew that he could have an effect. After the flood, Noah and his sons got out of the ark. Guess what? They had lots and lots of children, and the world started to fill up again. And in Genesis, the 10th chapter, in verse 8, we want to turn there. Genesis 10 and verse 8. And this is... Um, Noah's uh, grandson, Cush, begot Nimrod. And it says, he began to be a mighty one on earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it is said, like Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. Now, the language there is not really descriptive of what was going on there. This is blunted down language. It was translated poorly by King James Boyce. Very poorly. 
mighty. He was a mighty hunter. Hebrew 1368. It is the intensive of the Hebrew 1367, which means very mightily strong. He was, in the physical sense, an imposing individual. He was strong. He was skillful. He was capable. He was the superlative human being. And he was a, a hunter in many senses of the word. Hunter in terms of hunting animals and hunting men. And hunting in the sense of a warrior. And it says that he was before the Lord. Interesting word. Interesting word. The Lord. It's uh, Said, Hebrews 67, 18. Before the Lord, Hebrews 64, 40. Panaim. And it means, this panaim, it means in front of, as in being more important than. So we have a man here who was capable in pretty much all of his human ways that was able to exert influence and domination over all of the people around him. And he began to feel of himself as being more important or superior to God himself. As my grandmother would have said about me at certain occasions in my growing up, I was getting too big for my britches. Nimrod was getting too big for his britches. He thought that he was bigger than he actually was. Verse 8, he, it shows that he was successful. He was the mighty one, the gibor, the warrior, the tyrant, the champion, the chief, the villain, the mighty warrior who became king and could impose his thoughts on other people. And so he decided, since I am big, well, I am just almost eternal like God is. Oh, I am eternal like God. I am God. Who fostered that idea? Who fed that lie into his mind? The father of lies. The same father of lies fed that into Nimrod's mind that will feed that into the beast's mind at the end of things. Where it says, he says, I am God. I have become God. So many cultures down through history since this time have granted that their kings and their emperors were gods. The Egyptians did. The Japanese have. This was before Babel, before everything was scattered out. The thoughts that were coming into people's minds here Scattered to the entire earth. That's the reason that you have Christmas in the Ukraine. You have a Christmas-like celebration all over this globe. In every culture that has ever been. There's only one problem. Men die. How do you continue deification when Nimrod dies? 
Nimrod had a wife. And she was a piece of work. To put it lightly. She had a son by Nimrod who was called Tammuz. And this is where the idea of the counterfeit of Christ comes from. Because she says, we've got control over these people. Now, Nimrod, who is big and strong and capable and able, is no longer here. The Epic of Gilgamesh, a legend, and other sources basically say that uh, Great Uncle Shem actually killed Nimrod and cut him up into pieces. He basically executed Nimrod for his idolatry. But the system was in motion. And what Semiramis at that point did was say, oh, this baby I had, Nimrod's baby, is actually Nimrod. He has been resurrected. And look, now he is the son. He is the son. But he's deified, so he is the son. So we need to worship the son. And so we come to the 25th of December, which was Tammuz's birthday. About the 21st, or a little before the 21st of December, all of the stargazers in the, the Babylonian realm, and they were practiced at observing the sun, moon, and stars because they were impressed by them. And they said that, look, the days are getting shorter and shorter and shorter and sh shorter. Pretty, pretty soon. Pretty soon. Well, the, the sun's going to go away. The sun's going to go away and uh, how are the crops going to grow? And how are we going to get, uh, you know, ramen noodles for next year? We've got to, and this is egged on by Samaramus. Yeah, yeah, the sun's going to go away. You've got to do something. You have to start acting and do things. They didn't remember that God told Noah in Genesis, the eighth chapter. Genesis, the eighth chapter in verse 22. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, and day and night shall not cease. Now, had they read that? But they've got the people who had control over their mind telling them, the sun's going to go away. You've got to do something. So, Nimrod was a tree that was cut down. Take part of that log and burn it. The heat, it might go up to the sun and, 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 and help the sun along to continue to come back. And why don't we have, why don't we have a, um, a child mass? A child mass. One of the practices. Take one of your children and burn them. That adds life to the God. Child sacrifice. Where did the idea of child sacrifice come from? God said it didn't come from him. It came from here and has been going on 
we in our society are sacrificing our children in different ways. We're exploiting them. This is where it started. And they also said, you're having the Christmas spirit. You're having the spirit of Nimrod. You're having this spirit where you're all together doing the same thing and really enjoying it. That'll help Nimrod come back too. Do what feels good for a short period of time before December the 21st. And so they started doing all sorts of bad things. And it's okay. You can do that. You can do that for a while, but then we have to go back. In the Saturnalia in Rome, they actually turned all the slaves loose. They said, go out and have fun. You are the masters of the realm for these few days. But then you're going to be slaves again. But Go have fun in the meantime. Well, guess what? The slaves liked that. They thought that was great. And the people got into the fun of it. Because after all, it's helping the sun come back. December 21st, shortest day of the year. Oh, this is getting dire. It's getting shorter. December the 22nd. Whoa, wait a minute. Well, not sure. December the 23rd. Oh, oh it's looking, it, it looks like it might be turning around. 24th. December the 25th. Hooray! Semiramis told us that the child was reborn. The son is coming back. The only difference is in the name. It was of Babylonian origin. Nimrod cut down, cut in pieces. Reborn as Tammuz on December the 25th. And the basis of that lie has been carried down by every culture since then on the face of the earth. Brumalia, in the Eastern Roman Empire, the Saturnalia in Rome, the Yule among the, uh, the Nordish people, similarities all the way down to the worship of the Green Movement now, the worship of foreign gods. Problem is, and then came Christ. Then came the true Messiah, the true God. And he was resurrected. And Christianity began to grow and began to spread. And is still, the plan of God is real and active. But then came the apostasy. What were they going to do? Well, oh, I know what we'll do. We'll just change the name. It's no longer Saturnalia. And we have to tweak a few things. We, uh, we, we have to... Uh, we have to make a few changes, but all of these people are not going to give up all this fun. And that's what they did. And it's come down to us with all of the things that go with it. The gift giving, the feeling of warm, fuzzy, the endorphins and the serotonin. We have our serotonin. We have our understanding. Does that not give us happiness? 
God says he wants us to call the Sabbath a joy. He wants us to have those good things, but the real good things and the things that worship him. Deuteronomy, the fifth chapter. Deuteronomy, fifth chapter. So, verse six. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. And brethren, that same God has brought each and every one of us out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall have no other gods before me. No person that says, I was born on December the 25th and I am the sun in the sky. Our devotion and our entire loyalty is to that God that no one is in front of. The one true God. God. 